Well, good morning. We are now in 1 Peter chapter 4, working our way through the book of 1 Peter. Lots of good stuff. Uh, in the last chapter uh, is when he says what's on the slide there, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. And when he gets to that, he's already worked through quite a bit. And we're going to work through the rest of what he says in um, chapter 4 today. But before we get into it, let me pray. Father God, uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for this fellowship of people. Lord, I pray that um, you would continue to draw each one of us closer to you by your word and spirit, that you would do the same for me, Lord, that you would um, just send your spirit so I would rightly divide your word, that uh, people would forget what I said, but uh, they would know that you spoke to them in spirit, Lord. We, we pray for that help. We pray for that joy, and we thank you that we have this, this fellowship, these relationships, and this church to come to. In Jesus' name, amen. So the process we should always be asking ourselves when we approach the Bible, whether it's First Peter, is uh, what's God saying to me in his word? That's a question, right? Lots of questions. What does God want me to learn? And then the other question is, what am I going to do about it? One of the things in this world about sharing the gospel is people are sharing the gospel and they say, no, you really don't have to change your life. Uh, you can be the same person when you come to faith as you can after faith. Uh, and that application is not true because uh, what Peter's talking about here is basically dying to yourself, putting off the old self and putting on the new self. So if you're sharing the gospel with somebody, say, yeah, it's the best thing ever. It's going to radically change you, right? And so that's why we ask that question, what am I going to do about it? What is the change that God is putting in our lives? So what I want to do is I want to just give a brief summary of the concepts, and we talked about this last week, the concepts that Peter is dealing with. First, salvation. He's talking to a group who, of people who are, have received salvation, and they were in synagogues, probably in Rome, and uh, some of them are Gentiles, and some of them are Jews. If you read this, you would think he was writing to a Jewish author with all of the Old Testament reference that he left. But they're probably Jews and Gentiles, and they are in uh, what is now considered modern-day Turkey. And so when Jesus talks, uh, when Paul talks, Peter, whichever guy, talks about, <laughs> talks about what's going on here, first thing is your salvation. These are people, hopefully like us, who have realized that we are sinners separated from Christ by our sin, and the only way that we can restore that relationship is through Jesus Christ's atoning death and resurrection for our salvation. Romans 10.9, obviously we talk about it all. If you confess Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's your salvation. That's the foundation of this, and he's writing to, he's writing to believers. And so then Paul is often in this letter talked about submission. Once you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, if he's Lord, if he's the big boss, then we have an obligation to follow him in the way that he prescribes. And you'll remember last week, he gives this analogy about uh, when he's talking about suffering, he gives this analogy about Noah and the flood and how the ark was the vessel that they rode on uh, uh, above the flood right when the water came and their their action their obedience of getting on the flood was out of their belief in Je belief in God and what he said right they believed that God would, was going to do what he said he was going to do. Noah preached for 120 years while he was building the ark. And his action of belief was to get on the ark and God closed the door from the outside. So Paul has left us with this analogy of this obedience that Noah had and the salvation. The picture there is now Jesus is the vessel of our salvation. So we believe it. And then there's the action of getting on and the action of baptism by obedience then the process of sanctification when you first become a believer in jesus christ and paul is talking about this you bring a lot of sin into it right and he says the highest hardest thing that you can say as a believer is that be holy as the lord your god is holy right god requires that well how do we as sinners get the sin out of our lives we have that as a goal. We don't look at the people around us and go, well, I'm doing better than that guy or I'm doing better than that gal. 
it's not a comparative thing. We're always measuring ourselves against the flawless word of Jesus Christ. And when we sin, we know, if you'll remember from the book of 1 John, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So that sanctification, hopefully I look back and I'm not perfect. Some days I don't even have it close to right, but I don't have the same sin issues in my life as I did when I was a new believer, right? And that doesn't make me a Pharisee. It doesn't make me better than anybody. It's just that God has changed me a lot, right? And the things that didn't used to bother me about myself in sin really bother me now. When I make the mistakes, when 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 pride bubbles up, and I don't know about you guys, but pride is the thing. When it bubbles up, I'm like, I thought by this time in my walk I'd be over that, and I'm just not. But God is faithful to forgive me, right? So that's the sanctification process. You become more like Christ. Then serving one another. We serve each other. This is a great place because we all see each other serving. I mean, we put a meal together. Everybody cleans. Every, this, this thing runs great, and, I, um, and it's just because people love each other. I direct very few things here. I just don't have to. And it's fantastic. Thank you for that. <laughs> it, because you guys just serve each other and you serve the church. And it's just a beautiful thing. So that I appreciate. And then suffering. Here's the hard thing. Here's the hardest thing because Peter has said just ridiculous things. Like honor the emperor. Honor those in power above you. And he was talking to a group of people who their emperor was Caesar Nero. Caesar Nero was a horrible human being. And he killed lots of people, his own and Christians and stuff. And then he says that to us. And if we've seen the lead, if you've seen our leadership, well, they're not Nero, but they're not great. Right. And so when he says honor the emperor and we have to somehow figure out what that means. Right. We can speak out against the things that are out there in the world but we have to be Christ-like and we have to be praying for those people as God requires. We can't be slanderous Christians against the people who are in power, right? And that's a difficult thing. So Paul has put these four concepts together and he's covered them. And now in chapter four, he's going to go and he's going to talk about the urgency of those things, who you used to be in the urgency of those things. Because as we look at the first word in chapter four, and you guys should know this by now. Whenever you see therefore in the Bible, you have to ask exactly what is it there for? Because of everything I just covered, everything that Peter just covered in his, in his letter, you know, don't do evil. The thing about the undeserved suffering that we talked about last week, submission to slaves and masters and um, being God's living stones, right? And Jesus is the cornerstone and he gives us the direction. And then Paul, Peter has now then given us the direction. So when he starts with therefore, because of everything he said in the letter to this point, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no, uh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. For there has already been enough time spent doing what the Gentiles do, carrying on in uh, unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. Then they're surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living and they slander you, they will give an account to the one who stands re ready uh, to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that, uh, through, so that though they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. So, he starts with the therefore, because of everything I just told you, he says... Because Christ suffered, sense can also be because Christ suffered in the flesh. Arm yourself with the same understanding. Because the one who suffers in the flesh is done with sin. That's a tall order. So what he's saying here is, uh, hey, look, arm yourselves with the same understanding. Matthew in the fifth chapter is pretty clear. You're going to suffer because I suffered. That's what he tells his believers. And even though Jesus was 100% perfect, being all God and all man, he suffered in the flesh. 
not because of his sin, but because he was in a sinful world and he had to suffer like us to understand us, right? The book of Hebrews says, we don't have a high priest who can't understand our afflictions. Jesus walked before us, so when we have a bad day, Jesus knows what it feels like. He suffered undeservingly, right? Sometimes, not always, but sometimes our suffering is because of our sin. Sometimes it's just because we're in a sinful world, right? And it's, sometimes it's hard to know the difference, but arming ourselves with the same understanding. Look, we have to understand, we shouldn't be surprised, we shouldn't be taken back when we, have the, when, when, when we, when we are suffering things that we're going to suffer, right? That's one of the hard things about Christianity. I don't like suffering. You know what I like? Easy. Remember the commercials for, was it Staples? They had the easy button. You hit that thing and, oh, everything's easy. That's what I want for all of my life, right? <laughs> and so what he's referring to here, I think based on uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the text here, is that the one who suffers in the flesh is si- finished with sin. Understand this, that the process that he's talking about here in this sanctification and submission, what he's talking about is the difficulty of actually suffering suffering through telling your flesh no. And you can make any example there, right? What what is it? You know, I mentioned pride. We all don't, I I don't know if as a person, if you ever have just liked to let your pride and anger run. I'm, I'm superior to that person. I'm superior to the situation. I'm just better than it or however it works, right? Not giving God credit, whatever it is. And to cap that off, it's difficult. You're going to suffer when you tell your flesh no. What are the, what are the things? We all have something. You can, uh, what are the things that we have that we do that we should put out of the flesh? Anyaholic, alcoholic, workaholic, drugaholic, sexaholic, those things that we desire in the flesh, it's, we're going to suffer a little bit when you, tell, when you tell yourself no. When you say, I'm going to follow God and put that out of my life, the internal, the internal struggle is real. When God says, be holy as I am holy, sometimes you don't want to be holy. Sometimes I just want to be mad and I just want to do what I want to do and, and say what I want to say and be right in my way. And you know what? That's wrong. And I have to fight my flesh to do that. And we probably all have, we probably all have something in our flesh. I mean, when I first came to Christianity, it was hard because it was like, well, you know, before I was a believer, nobody cared if I got real drunk and act ridi- rid- ridiculous. It was fun. And, and you know what? We all have that thing because guess what? Sin is fun. It's real fun. It can be real fun for a minute until you're trapped and then you're down a bad path. And then you're just handcuffed to the horrible sin that you're in, right? So it's not like sin is easy either, but when you're fighting against sin, you're fighting against the thing you're going to fight against all of your life until God takes you home. Remember, Philippians says, He, Jesus, who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. We're going to fight this until Jesus comes back again. But we have to be thinking of it like he says here that we're finished with sin. I am done with that. You know, in, uh, in the third book of Peter, uh, uh, third Peter, he talks about people coming back to their sin like a dog coming back to their vomit. And it's, it's disgusting, right? Because you guys have always, it's just horrible. You see the dog heave and then it throws up and then it walks around a little bit and then starts to eat it. It's like, oh, so gnarly, right? But that's what sin is. And if you go back to, and so next time you're getting, next time you're getting into sin that you've struggled with, just have that picture in your mind that Peter gives us And that's what it looks like to God. Stop it. It's disgusting, right? (laughs) That's what he's talking about. So that the, the, the next part of the verse there in two, in order that the remaining time in the flesh will no longer be for human desires, but for God's will. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's super important because when we're talking about those things that God requires for us to be in good relationship with God, he wants us to have a clean slate. That's, that's one of the reasons why when God says, hey, be holy as I'm holy, so you can have a close relationship with him. One of the fruits of that is obviously the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. 
the other fruit of that is that people around us see that and they should think, I want that Christianity. That looks good. That looks real good. That's, those, are the, those are the things that come out of this. So then, uh, because he goes on to say, hey, because there's already been enough time spent doing what the Gentiles do, carrying on in uh, uh, unrestrained behavior, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, lawless idolatry. And so when, when you look at that to it, before you were a believer, whether you, whether you came to, to faith at seven or five or 45 or 55, you spent plenty of time doing what non-believers did. Time to stop. That's what he's saying, right? Because sometimes, he, sometimes, I don't know if you guys have had this, just trying to be unhonest. I don't have as much as I used to. But sometimes I'm just like... Phew. I could cut loose like I did when I was a non-believer. I could just do whatever, right? Whatever it was, I could just let the flesh run. I could do it. And then I stop, right? But that's, that's a temptation because sometimes when things are hard, when we're stressed, instead of turning to God, we turn to what the flesh wants. And here's, here's an interesting thing that I saw the other day. You know why the flesh wants that? Your flesh isn't living on to the next world. It's grounded here. Your spirit, that, that the person that you are is going on. That's where the, and the Bible talks about that. The, the, the fight between the spirit and the flesh. So when you, when you find yourself, hopefully we, when we find ourselves as believers in that situation where we get back to the thought of I'm stressed and this is how I used to cope with it before I was a believer, hopefully we're doing things that God wants us to do to cope with our troubled life rather than doing the things that we did in the flesh before that. And so that's what he's, that's what he's talking about there. And so when he goes on here, then, then he says, hey, they're surprised that you don't join them in the same thing. Hey, look, you don't, you don't drink anymore? You don't get high anymore? You're not going to do that? They're surprised that you don't do it because they don't, people who are non-believers often don't have the same moral struggle because guess what? They don't know that they're sinning. There are so many people that we assume out there that they're not living Christian lives because they know better. Honestly, a lot of people just don't know better. And, and, and it's astounding. I could give you an example and exam, after example of people that, that have said things to me and they're like, oh, we're not supposed to do that? No. No. Do you know why? Because God set the law. So when we look at a world out there and people are like giving you a hard time, hey, I don't do that because I'm Christian. Well, you're a stupid do-gooder or goody two what, what? I don't know what the terms are. Th those are old terms. Well, I don't know what the terms are now. So, so maybe, maybe you young guy, you young guys could tell me what the terms are or whatever, but I, but th they'll give you a hard time, right? Because when you don't join them, they're going to mock you. And, and in that, that, that's, that's really difficult, right? Because, um, uh, and this is one of the things I didn't really struggle with is that some people actually care what the people out there think right? I used to be like, I don't care what you think. And, and for me, it was the opposite way. I had to learn to care what people thought because people who care about me should, I should really care what they think, right? I had the opposite problem. I was so prideful. I didn't care what anybody thought. <laughs> don't, don't swing that way either. But the, the people out there that don't, aren't invested in your life and your fa faith, they're going to think about a, lo a, a lot of things, right? And this is a thing that, that especially the younger generation deals with uh, on, on social media, right? That's real. That's a real thing to them. It's not a real thing to me, but that's a very, very real thing to other people. And it's difficult. It really is difficult. And if you think about, you know, us older guys, think about junior high and high school, how how, how difficult that was when you got made a fun of something if you were a Christian. And now think about that being on the internet for all time for everybody to get a thousand clicks on. It's difficult, right? But when he says that, he's talking about, uh, hey, um, they're surprised. But earlier he said, don't surprise, be surprised when you suffer, right? Because in verse 5, they'll give an account. They're going to stand before God for that. And again, that should be another another reason why we want to live a holy life because that shouldn't be like ha ha that guy made a fun of me you know what he's gonna he's gonna give an account to god for what he did to me <laughs> that guy god is gonna smoke that guy so hard <laughs> that's not god's heart he's telling us that look that guy's gonna give an account and if he's making a fun of me and i am christ-like to him maybe he or she will come to the lord through my good action through my not coming to him like that, because when we think about somebody perishing and get this judgment, 
That should be alarming to us. Somebody, even our enemy, who, sa- who you know is heading to eternal judgment, you should love them and think, I want to find a way to live and be able to articulate the gospel to them because I don't want them to have the judgment. I want them to have the judgment that I have. I'm going to be judged through the work of Jesus Christ, not my own works. Thank goodness, because if you've met me, my works aren't always that great, <laughs> right? So, so when, he, when he says that, they're going to be judged. Careful how you handle that. You should handle that out of love and being God's example. For this reason, in verse 6, the gospel was preached to those who are now dead, and although they might be judged according to the flesh and human standards, they might live according to God's standards. That's exactly what I just said. They're going to be judged in the flesh, hopefully, that they might be judged uh, to human standards, that they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. I think what, what Peter's saying there is, hey, look, we want them to have that same thing. I want to pray for them so they know Jesus Christ like I do. So they're judged by Jesus through Jesus Christ, not by Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. So when we look at a lost and dying world and these people who are persecuting us uh, or saying the hard things, whatever they are, whatever it's the kind of persecution we have now, whether it's persecution later, this is what we want for them. We want them to be in the Spirit so they can be judged by God's forgiving standards, not his judgment standards. And that's hard to do, especially when somebody's hurt your feelings, right? Because, because, because all that for us, you know, the, uh, the old saying, um, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I'm calling liar, liar, pants on fire on that, right? <laughs> if you can get back to that. Because people say mean things and it hurts, right? We can admit that we're all grown ups. People have hurt my feelings when they've said mean things, even when I've denied it, <laughs> right? So, so that can be difficult. So then he goes on and he talks about the urgency because now he's switching to talking about the end is getting near. This is important for you to consider. Verse seven, and uh, the, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and be sober minded for prayer above all maintain constant love for one another since love covers a multitude of sins be hospitable to one another without complaining just as each one received a gift use it to serve others as god uh as good stewards of the varied grace of god if anyone speaks let it be as one who speaks god's words and if anyone serves let it be from the strength god provides so that he might be glorified through jesus christ in every Everything to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So when he says the end is near, what does that mean? Right? Because if we if we flip on over, you can flip there if you want, or just follow along in Acts chapter one. We see the disciples saying. And this is uh, starting in verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you going to restore the, uh, when are you going to, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the days or the periods that the Father has set by his authority, but you will receive my power by the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit has come come on you and be you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth and after he had said this he was taken up as they were watching in a cloud and took them out of their sight and while he was going they were gazing into heaven suddenly two men in white clothes stood with them and they said men of Galilee why do you stand looking up to heaven this Jesus who is taken from you into heaven will come the same way Uh, that you have seen him going into heaven. So we know for sure a couple of things. That we don't know when the end time is, that we're given power to be his witnesses, and that he's coming back. And if Peter is talking about end times, and that was 2,000 years ago, what about now? So there's a couple things we have to consider. First of all, the Bible tells us that God looks at it as a, as a day as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. God is outside time. He created time. So when he talks about the end being near, we need to understand that, hey, look, it's nearer than it was. And in God's sight, in eternity, a couple of thousand years is still pretty close. 
right? He's not thinking about time the same, same way that we are. The other thing is, there's a lot of grace in that. Just imagine, had the Lord come back before I was about 28 and, con- and confessed Jesus as Lord. It's really graceful to me that God didn't come back while I was still a sinner, while I was still unsaved. There's a lot of grace in the fact that God hasn't come back yet. So we should be expectantly waiting for Jesus. We should maybe see, know what's going on around us so we can you know, look at the end times and see we don't want to live there because a the mandate is to get to work, be my witnesses. Here's the other thing. Uh, when God looks at us, we are his children. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been children or had children, right? But uh, if mom and dad ran an errand and said, we're going to be back in two hours, have your room clean. I'd have goofed around all day if they were gone all day, right? (laughs) Or if they leave and they don't tell me when they're coming back, I'm going to goof around all day, (laughs) right? If... I don't know when they're coming back and I really care. I'm going to take care of business like I'm supposed to. So I I think he puts that in there for us as believers, right? If I have a deadline, like I have things that are a deadline and they're conceptual because they're way out there, big projects and stuff. When that hits my calendar a week before, now that's a thing I'm going to do, right? Right now it's only a concept. If I don't, if if I have an exact deadline, I'm not going to hurry up and do what I'm supposed to do. But if you don't know when he's coming back, the thing is we should always be on alert because it, it could be tomorrow. It could be today. It could be a thousand years from now. But if I don't think that he's coming back soon, I could be goofing around in my faith. I could be taking it easy, not serving, not working, right? So there's some tension there in what he does for that. So hopefully we take that as, okay, we're supposed to be witnesses, get to work. We don't know when he's coming back, but if he comes back tomorrow, he's not going to find me goofing off in my old sin life. That's what he's getting at. So, so I think that's important for us because, well, it's important for me for certain. Maybe you guys are better at deadlines than me, but I'm just not. So, and then he says, uh, love covers a multitude of sins. Constant love for one another. All things are near and keep loving one another. And we saw a perfect example of this in the world. So, Paul, you get up and you give Gary a hug and you said, I've missed him like a flower's missed the sunshine. And you know what? That is awesome, right? Because the world has said, that's a foolish thing. Why would, ah, two dudes did that. It's so weird, right? No, that's how it's supposed to look. That's how it's supposed to be, right? And everybody clapped because we're like, hey, we, Gary was gone and, and, and now he's back. And so, that's what's, we just had a perfect example of that. I wish we'd had on the camera so we could put that in there. So good for you guys, right? <laughs> and and, and so, sometimes, uh, just and, and it wasn't that it was wrong that Gary was gone or anything. It's just that that's the kind of love that we should have. So you would think in that relationship or any relationship, when you look at another person and they fail horribly, they're not being Christ-like, when they, when they fail horribly, Hopefully, if that was the same case and there was a sin issue, you would see the same love, the same hug, and the same applause that, hey, we're going to love each other through our shortcomings. Love covers a multitude of sins. Because, look, we could be hateful and angry, and what does that do? It just perpetuates sin. But if you look at what Jesus did, look at the covering of his love. He was on the cross. People were mocking him, and he said to the Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's big love. That's big forgiveness. And that's how we should be treating each other. So, and then uh, be hospitable to one another, not complaining, just as one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the very grace of God. And we did talk about that a little bit. This is a group that serves each other. I see, and not just here in this church, this is a group of people who serves. I'm proud of you guys for that. It's great to see. It's just, it's just refreshing. And that's the thing that the world sees too. And so, so it's not that we can't get better or rest on our laurels about that, but hey, look, we have a good, we, we have a great gift from God and it's good to use it for other people. So then going on in verse 11, if anyone speaks, let him be one as who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let him use the strength that God uh, provides. 
that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ and everything. Hey, look, that's important, right? I can be 100% sure that if I'm reading this, I am speaking God's words, right? Um, but if I'm living this, when I talk to other people, hopefully there'll be an outpouring of the things that I know from the Bible and I'm using them to talk to each other. But you can tell that if you're speaking love to another person, you're speaking God's language, even if you're not speaking scripture. Because our, our, our lives and our, and, and, and our self should be so permeated by God's love and his, his words of scripture and his words that we should be just spewing that love out on other people, right? And let us, let us serve through uh, the, uh, the strength that God provides. This is important too because I don't know about you guys, but sometimes people have needed something and needed help and needed service. And uh, I've just been tired. I've just been tired. And sometimes I've been like, yeah, it's fine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help that person because God wants me to. Because <laughs> I know what's the right thing to do right now. <laughs> I just want a nap. <laughs> We've probably all been there, right? Could be your kids. Could be your spouse. Could be somebody outside the church. But hey, look. Hey, if you have to serve somebody and have that attitude, guarantee if you stop and you say, God, fill me with your love, fill me with your strength that he's going to provide, it's going to work out good. You're going to walk away from that going, I did the right thing for the right reason and with the right heart, right? Back to that example as a kid, right? I used to teach my kids, when you're sent to do a task, it's not just the task. I want you to match your attitude that you have a bedroom and you have toys with an attitude of thankfulness and you're take care, taking care of it out of thankfulness, right? It should be the same thing as adults, right? It's easier to explain that to kids sometimes than adults, but it's the same concept, right? If you have, have the ability to strength, be thankful. It's the attitude that matters. And, and, and then he just ends this little section with glory be to God forever and ever because he's going back to God. Hey, God gave me the strength to serve. How beautiful is that? And then he's going to go on in verse 12 here, and he's going to talk about suffering. Dear friends, don't be surprised when a fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual has happened to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, uh, glory and of God rests on you. Let no one suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evil dueler, or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him do it. Uh, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. And again, he says, hey, remember he started, started with, uh, hey, uh, you're going to get, <laughs> you're going to suffer in the flesh, Right. And then he says, hey, don't be surprised when the fire, fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as something unusual were happening to you. Remember Jesus' example. And we know that persecuted Christians are all over the world, that they're actually having a fiery example. Like in northern India, they're burning churches with believers in it. And uh, the reality is that, hey, look, we live in a world where there's fiery ordeals coming at us all the time in a different way. We're suffering the things that we suffer. Sometimes because the world we live in, there's illness, there's, uh, <laughs> the, the, courts are, the courts are not a legal system, they're a law system, and they're slanderous, and they're terrible, and, and you can get persecuted at work. I know Christians that have lost their jobs, lost their status. So it's one of those things where, hey, look, uh, it's hard not to be surprised, right? Because if you think about it, every now and again, you're just walking around and you get hit in the mouth and you're like, oh, I didn't think I was going to get hit in the mouth today. Not literally, but by life, right? And we're surprised by that, but God's saying, hey, don't, don't be surprised because I told you 
that this was going to happen, right? There are those out there who say they're ministers of the gospel and they say, you're going to have health, wealth, and prosperity. I don't see that in the Bible, right? You could have prosperity. You could have health and wealth. Those are not bad things, but it's saying it's almost like God is a genie in the bottle. That's not what it's talking about. So, uh, don't be surprised when something like something unusual is happening to you. Again, back to that example, it happened to Christ. It's going to happen to us. Instead, rejoice as we share in the sufferings of Christ that we may rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. We were talking about this just yesterday in the grocery store that uh, James, uh, James, uh, the first chapter of James, count it all joy when you suffer various trials. I struggle with that still, right? I struggle with, hey, this is a hard trial. This is a hard thing that's happening. How do I rejoice in it? So this is one <laughs> that I find really difficult. I can, I can get in a bad place when I'm suffering because I don't like it. And I'm surprised by it, right? I'm not, I, I don't necessarily follow this, but when, we, when God asks us to do that rejoice and he says, count it all joy when you suffer various trials. Why? Why is that? And I would answer to you, the answer to that question is eternal perspective. If you, and I won't go now, there to it now in the interest of time, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there's a whole list of everything that Paul suffered. Shipwrecks, beatings, stoning. They stoned that guy to death one time, and they got around him and prayed on him, and he got back up and walked through the city. That's a bad day, <laughs> right? I, I mean, if you're on your way to heaven and they pray and you bring you back, <laughs> what? And, and, and it hurts to get hit in, the, hit in the head with rocks a lot right? And so what Paul says about that in 2 Corinthians 4 is that these are light momentary afflictions that are building up for us a weight of eternity that we cannot grasp the sight of heaven. So when it says that, Peter's talking about the eternal perspective that we're going to spend an eternity in Christ. This is a blip. God is going to comfort me in these deep times of sorrow and guess what? He's going to do something here on this earth. I guarantee you that I have seen probably hundreds of Christians go through terrible situations and their handling of the situation, their joy in the situation has strengthened my faith as much as anything I can imagine. Terrible things have happened to people or just circumstances. And I've just been strengthened by the way they've handled it in a godly way. And that's that's part of the hope. So there's not just hope in heaven, but when we see each other walking through our trials in a godly way, we're strengthened. We know, oh, they have the hope of heaven. I should not feel sorry for myself. I should turn to God. These are important things. That's what he's saying here in, in, in this verse. So, and then he goes back to talking about that ridicule that, uh, th that, we are, that we already have. Here in uh, verse 13, instead, you share the sufferings of Christ and rejoice. And then if you're ridiculed for his name because of Christ, because the Spirit rests on you, let no one... So, so it's saying you're going to suffer as a believer, right? But what it's saying is you should never suffer for the following... And he just, he just kicks it off, right? If you're a Christian, you should never suffer because you murdered somebody. That's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But I want to, I mean, we're going to be in Matthew, remember, not so many months from now, Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, he defines if you're angry at your brother and you have hate, you've already committed murder in your heart. It's not just the outward act, it's how you look at other people. That's important. So that, that's included in here. Don't be a thief. Hey, if you're a believer, you shouldn't be being arrested and persecuted for thievery, right? An evildoer and a meddler. Look, he starts with murder. And I don't know if this is an ascending list or a descending list, but a meddler, just think about gossip, slander. Our mouths can cause damage. There's hate in that. And that murder and that slander are hooked together because the heart of it, when, you, when you're a meddler or you're slandering somebody, you, there's, whether you think about it or not, there's intent to do harm. And so what he's saying, hey, as a believer, don't be meddling in other people's affairs. Don't be meddling and don't be doing all that sort of stuff because you should not be, because if you get persecuted for that, uh -uh, that's not what God's talking about. You know, I know some believers that say, oh, yeah, I got persecuted because I'm a Christian. 
No, you got persecuted because you're a jerk. It's different. <laughs> you're, you're a believer, but stop being a jerk, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and you may have somebody in mind or not. I, I, I'm, I won't name names, and they're not here. But over the years, I've met a few people that are like, yeah, I'm a good Christian because I'm getting slandered. That's not, no, <laughs> going on in, in 15 let none of you suffer as a murderer. Oh, sorry, I already did that. Uh, then, uh, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God's name. And that's going to be the same thing, you know? And, and, and we live in a time where we look at the world and we see persecution that is where people are losing their lives, martyrdom. Hey, know that we suffer some slander and stuff here and that, hey, you may have relationships with people in your life that are giving you a hard time because you don't live that sinful life anymore. Don't be ashamed of that. It's okay for you to say, hey, look, I'd rather for you make fun of me than the God of the universe not, <laughs> not be in close relationship with him, right? If I have to choose, and that's a hard choice because it's like, ah, you know, the people are right in front of us are saying hurtful things, God of the universe. It should be an easy choice, but we all know it's not. So what he's saying is, hey, if you have to make the choice, if the whole world is slandering me, but I am right with God, I'm going to choose being right with God. And you guys can just say whatever you want. Going on in 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And it begins with us. What will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? Again, he's going back to this concept. You're judged through Jesus Christ and his works. God is going to see you on judgment day through God's perfect atoning work. Everybody who's not in that camp is going to be seen through their sin. Judgment, separation from God, eternity in hell. So when we go back to looking at our salvation and our submission and how we walk this thing, we should be thinking about how do those disobey see this? Am I being a picture and the words of the gospel like I am supposed to be? Because we need to be thinking about what if they disobey the gospel? I don't want the guy that's given me a hard time to go to hell and be separated from Christ, right? And I've even had friends like that. When, when I left the party scene, I, did, I, get, I got made fun of a lot, right? And those people I love, I want to see them come to faith, and so uh, he, he just says that again in verse 18. A righteous person is saved with difficulty. And what will become of the ungodly sinner? He's asking that same thing. It was a real difficult thing for Jesus Christ to go to the cross and die for our salvation. That was, that was a lot of difficulty, right? And if God took the trouble to do that difficult thing out of love for you, well, conversely... It's going to be bad for those who don't accept. And we should be thinking about that. So then, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. And he leaves that example in, in chapter 4 of, hey, our behavior towards God should be good for the purpose of us having close relationship so we can have the fruit of the Spirit so then the other fruit is how the world sees us and sees the gospel. It's a tall order first, you, you know, and, and if we're always focusing on God, we don't really need to worry about what the world's thinking. Easy to say, hard to do, but it's important. So yeah, tall order. So if you're looking at that um, uh, this week, just, just ask God, hey, what is it in my behavior? What, it is, what is it in my heart that I'm not doing right? Have I submitted to God in everything I'm doing? Is my life, my finances, my business, my, my work, is it all submitted to Christ? And am I doing it with joy? Could be a cool week, could be a hard week. I, I don't know, <laughs> but it's worth it. And then think about it. Talk about this with somebody. We do a good job of this here. And then look forward to next week because next week, I get to point all this back on me because it's talking about the leaders in the church. We're going to talk about the church leadership and we're going to get, I'll talk about how we run, uh, how the Calvary Chapel organization works and, and uh, qualifications and that sort of stuff. It's, it's good stuff. So you know there's expectations of church leaders, right? It's okay and it's good for you guys to have expectations because it can't be one of those things where there's a set of expectations for you, but I don't have to follow them because I've got it figured out. 
<laughs> if you've met me, you know that's not the case. So, so uh, spend some time in the Word this week and enjoy it. So let me pray. Father God, uh, thanks again for your Word. Lord, uh, uh, just feel like uh, I'm growing every week, Lord, and I, I thank you for that. Lord, uh, sometimes it's a struggle because uh, I look at myself in the mirror of your Word and uh, uh, don't feel great about it. But, uh, Lord, your, your love swallows that up. Your, your love... Um, uh, comforts my heart and changes me, and I thank you for that. Lord, I pray each person in here would be having that same same thing, where you just draw them close and take the things out of their life that aren't great. Lord, pray that you would guide us and bless us through this week, that you would bring us back together next week safe, and uh, in the meantime, fill us with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>